Book 11, Odysseus Meets the Shades of the Dead. When we reached our boat down on the beach, we dragged it out into the glittering sea, set up the mast and sail in our black ship, led on the sheep, and then embarked ourselves, still full of sorrow, shedding many tears. All day long the sail stayed full, and we sped on across the sea until the sun went down, and all sea routes grew dark. Our ship then reached the boundaries of deep-flowing Oceanus, a region always wrapped in mist and cloud. We sailed in there, dragged our ship on land, and walked along the stream of Oceanus until we reached the place Circe described. Peremides and Eurylochus Eurolo held the sheep, our sacrificial victims, while I unsheathed a sharp sword on my thigh and dug a hole two feet away. I poured out libations to all the dead, first with milk and honey, then sweet wine, and then a third with water. Around the pit I sprinkled barley meal. Then to the powerless heads of the departed I offered many prayers, the promises I'd sacrifice once I returned to Ithaca, a barren heifer in my home. With prayers and vows I called upon the families of the dead. Next I held the sheep above the hole and slit their throats. Dark blood flowed down. Then out of Erebus came swarming up shades of the dead, brides, young unmarried men, old ones worn out with toil, young tender girls with hearts still new to sorrow, and many men wounded by bronze spears who died in war, still in their bloodstained armor. Crowds of them came thronging in from all sides of the pit with amazing cries. Pale fear took hold of me. Then I called my comrades, ordering them to slay and burn the sheep still lying there, slain by cruel bronze, and pray to the gods to mighty Hades and dread Persephone. And then I drew the sharp sword on my thigh and sat there, stopping the powerless heads of all the dead from getting near the blood until I'd asked Tiresias my questions. Then appeared the ghost of my dead mother, Anticlea, brave Autolycus' daughter. I left her still alive when I set off for sacred to Troy. Once I caught sight of her, I, sw I wept, and I felt pity in my heart. But still, in spite of all my sorrow, I could not let her get too near the blood until I asked Tiresias my questions. Then came the shade of Tiresias from Thebes, holding a golden staff. I knew, he knew who I was and started speaking. Resourceful Odysseus, Laertes' son and Zeus's child, what now, you unlucky man? Why leave the sunlight, come to this joyless place and see the dead? Move from the pit and pull away your sword, so I may drink the blood and speak the truth. Tiresias finished talking. I drew back and thrust my silver-studded sword inside its sheath. When the blameless prophet had drunk dark blood, he said these words to me, Glorious Odysseus, you ask about your honey-sweet return, but a god will make your journey bitter. As soon as you've escaped the dark blue sea and reached the island of Thrinacia in your sturdy ship, you will find grazing there the cattle and rich flocks of Helios, who hears and watches over everything. If you leave them unharmed and keep your mind on your return, you may reach Ithaca, though you'll have trouble. But if you touch them, then I foresee destruction for your crew, for you, and for your ship. And even if you yourself escape, you'll get home again in distress and late in someone else's ship after losing every one of your companions. There will be trouble in your home, arrogant men eating up your livelihood and wooing your godlike wife by giving courtship gifts. But when you come, you'll surely take revenge for all their violence. Once you've killed the suitors in your house with your sharp sword, by cunning or in public, then take up a well-made oar and go, until you reach a people who know nothing of the sea, who don't put salt on any food they eat, and have no knowledge of ships painted red or well-made oars that serve the sea ships as wings. I'll tell you a sure sign you won't forget. When someone else runs into you and says you've got a shovel used for winnowing on your broad shoulders, then fix that fine oar in the ground there and make rich sacrifice to Lord Poseidon with a ram, a bull, and a boar that breathes with sows. Then leave. Go home, and there make sacred offerings to the immortal gods who hold wide heaven to all of them in order. Your death will come far from the sea, such a gentle passing when you are bowed down with ripe old age, and your people prospering around you. In all these things, I'm telling you the truth. He finished speaking. Then I replied and said, Tiresias, no doubt the gods themselves have spun the threads of this, but come, tell me and speak the truth. I can see there the shade of my dead mother sitting near the blood in silence. She does not dare confront the face of her own son or speak to him. Tell me, my lord, how she may understand just who I am. When I finished speaking, Tiresias quickly gave me his reply. I'll tell you so your mind will comprehend. It's easy. Whichever shadow of the dead you let approach the blood will speak to you and tell the truth. But those you keep away will once again withdraw. 
After saying this, the shade of Lord Tiresias returned to Hades' his home, having made his prophecy. But I stayed there, undaunted, till my mother came and drank dark blood. Then she knew me. Full of sorrow, she spoke out. Her words had wings. My son, how have you come while still alive down to this dark, sad darkness? For living men, it's difficult to come and see these things. Huge rivers, fearful waters stand between us. First and foremost, Oceanus, which no man can cross on foot. He needs a sturdy ship. Have you only now come here from Troy after a long time wandering with your ship and your companions? Have you not reached Ithaca nor seen your wife in your own home? When she finished, I answered her, Mother, I had come down to Hades' home to meet the shade of Tiresias of Thebes and hear his prophecy. I have not yet come near Achaea's shores or disembarked in our own land. I have been wandering around in constant misery ever since I left with noble Agamemnon bound for Troy to fight against the Trojans. But come now, tell me, what make what makes sure you speak the truth? What grievous form of death destroyed you? A lingering disease, or did Archer Artemis attack and kill you with her gentle arrows? And tell me of my father and my son, whom I left behind. Tell me of the wife I married. What are her thoughts and plans? Is she still there with our son, keeping watch on everything? Or has she been married to the finest Achaeans? When I had said this, my honored mother answered me at once. You can be sure she's waiting in your home, her heart so faithful, but her nights and days all end in sorrow with her shedding tears. As for your father, he stays on his farm and never travels down to the city. There he lies in sorrow, nursing in his heart enormous grief, longing you'll come back. A harsh old age has overtaken him. That's how I met my fate and died as well. I was not attacked and killed in my own home, but gentle arrows of the keen-eyed archer nor did I die of some disease which takes the spirit from our limbs as we waste away in pain. No, it was my longing for you, glorious Odysseus, for your loving care that robbed me of my life, so honey sweet. She finished. I considered how in my heart I wished to hold the shade of my dead mother. Three times my spirit prompted me to grasp her, and I jumped ahead, but each time she slipped out of my arms like a shadow or a dream. The pain inside my heart grew even sharper. Then I spoke to her, my words had wings. Mother, why do you not wait for me? I'd like to hold you so that even here in Shady's home we might throw loving arms around each other and then have our fill of icy lamentation. Or are you just a phantom royal Persephone has sent to make me groan and grieve the more? I spoke. My honored mother quickly said, My child, of all men most unfortunate, no, Persephone, daughter of Zeus, is not deceiving you. Once mortals die... This is what's set for them. Their sinews no longer hold the flesh and bone together. The mighty power of blazing fire destroys them once our spirit flies from us from our white bones. And then it slips away and, like a dream, flutters to and fro. Summary? Odysseus then describes how he saw a large number of shades of famous women from olden times. In summary. Odysseus paused. All Phaeacians sat in silence, saying not a word, spellbound in the shadowy hall. The first to speak was White Arm Arete, who said, Phaeacians, how does this man seem to you for beauty, stature, and within himself a fair, well-balanced mind? He is my guest, though each of you shares in his dishonor too, so don't be quick to send him on his way, and don't hold back your gifts to one in need. Then old warrior Echanius addressed them all, one of the Phaeacian elders there among them. Friends, what our wise queen has, has just said to us, as we'd expect, is not wide of the mark. You must attend to her, but the last word and the decision rest with Alcinous. Once Achenius finished, Alcinous spoke out. The queen indeed will have the final word, as surely as I live and am the king of the Phaeacians, men who love the oar. But though our guest is longing to return, let him try to stay until tomorrow. By then I'll have completed all our gifts. Resourceful Odysseus then replied to him and said, Lord Asinius, all of, all, of all men most renowned, if you asked me to stay for one whole year to organize my escort and give splendid gifts, then I would still agree. It's far better to get back to one's own dear native land with more wealth in hand. I'll win more respect, more love from anyone who looks at me whenever I return to Ithaca. Asinius then answered him and said, Odysseus, when we look at you, we do not perceive that you're in any way a lying fraud. Like many men, the black earth nourishes and scatters everywhere who make up lives from things no man has seen. You speak so well, and you have such a noble heart inside. You told your story with a minstrel skill, the painful agonies of all the Argives, and are your own as well. Come then, tell me this, and speak the truth. Did you see any comrades, those godlike men who went with you to Troy and meet their fate there? 
This night before us will be lengthy, astonishingly so. It's not yet time to sleep here in the halls, so tell me of these marvelous events. Resourceful Odysseus then answered him and said these words. Lord Asinius, if you are eager to hear even more, I will not hesitate to speak to you of other things more pitiful than these. I mean the troubles of these friends of mine who perished later, who managed to escape the Trojans' frightening battle cries, but died when they returned, thanks to the deceiviousness of a malicious woman. When sacred Persephone dispersed those female shadows here and there, then the grieving shade of Agamemnon, son of Atreus, appeared. Around him other shades had gathered, all those who died and met their fate alongside Agamemnon in Odysseus's house. He knew me at once. When he drunk some blood, he wept aloud, shedding many tears, stretching out his hands, keen to reach me. But he no longer had any inner power or strength, not like the force his supple limbs possessed before. I looked at him and wept. Pity filled my heart. Then I spoke to him. My words had wings. Lord Agamemnon, son of Atreus, king of men, what fatal net of grievous death destroyed you? Did Poseidon stir the winds into a furious storm and strike your ships? Or were you killed by enemies on land? while you were cutting out their cattle or rich flocks of sheep? Or were you fighting to seize their city and their women? I paused, and he at once gave me his answer. Resourceful Odysseus, Laertes' son, and Zeus's child, Poseidon didn't kill me and my ships by rousing savage winds into a vicious storm, nor was I killed by enemies on land. No, Aegisthus brought on my fatal end. He murdered me, and he, has, he was helped by my accursed wife after he'd invited me into his home and prepared a feast for me like an ox one butchers in its stall. And so I died the most pitiful of deaths. Around me they kept killing the rest of my companions like white tusked pigs. The saddest thing I heard was Cassandra, Priam's daughter, screaming. That traitor, Clytemnestra, slaughtered her right there beside me. Though I was dying, I raised my arms to strike her with my sword. But that dog-faced bitch turned her back on me. Though I was on my way to Hades, she made no attempts to use her fingers to close my eyelids, or to shut my mouth. Agamemnon finished. I answered him at once. That's horrible. Surely why thundering Zeus for many years has shown a dreadful hate towards the family of Atreus, thanks to the conniving of some woman. Many died for Helen's sake. And then Clytemnestra organized a trap for you while you were somewhere far away. As we stood there in sad conversation, full of sorrow and shedding many tears, Achilles' shade came up, son of Peleus, with those of splendid Atilicus and Patroclus too, as well as Ajax, who in his looks and body was the best of all Danaeans, after Achilles, who had no equal. Then the shadow of the swift-witted son of Aegeus knew who I was, and with a cry of grief he spoke to me. His words had wings. Resourceful Odysseus, Laertes' son, and Zeus's child, what a bold man you are! What exploit will your heart ever dream up to top this one? How can you dare to come down into Hades' home, the dwelling place of for the mindless dead, shades of worn-out men. Achilles spoke. I answered him at once. Achilles, son of Peleus, mightiest of the, by far of the Achaeans. I came here because I had to see a Tiresias. He might tell me a plan for my return to rugged Ithaca. I have not yet come near Achaean land. I have still not disembarked in my own country. I am in constant trouble. But as for you, Achilles, there is no man in earlier days who is more blessed than you, and none will come in future. Before now, while you were still alive, we Argives honored you as we did the gods. And now, since you come here, you rule with power among those who have died. So, Achilles, you have no cause to grieve because you're dead. I paused, and he immediately replied, Don't try to comfort me about my death, glorious Odysseus. I'd rather live working as a wage laborer for hire by some other man, one who had no land and not much in the way of livelihood, than lord it over all the wasted dead. With these words, the shade of swift Achilles moved off through the meadows filled with asphodel. The other shadows of the dead and gone stood there in sorrow, all asking questions about the ones they loved. The only one who stood apart was the shade of Ajax and a Telamon, still full of anger for my victory when I bested him beside our ships in that comp competition for Achilles' arms. His honored mother had offered them as prizes. The judges were sons of Troy and Pallas Athena. How I wish I'd never won that contest. Those weapons were the cause Earth swallowed up the life of Ajax, such a splendid man who, in his looks and actions, was the best of all Danaeans after the noble son of Peleus. I called to him. My words were meant to reassure him. Ajax, worthy son of Telamon, can't you forget even when you're dead you're angry at me over those destructive weapons? The gods made them a curse against the Argives when they lost to you. Such a tower of strength. Now you've been killed, Achaeans mourn your death unceasingly, just as they do Achilles, son of Peleus. 
No one is to blame but Zeus, who in his terrifying rage against the army of Danaean spearmen brought on your death. Come over here, my lord, so you can hear me as I talk to you. Let your proud heart and your anger now relent. I finished. He did not reply but left, moving off toward Erebus to join the other shadows of the dead and gone. For all his anger, he would have talked to me, or I to him. But in my chest and heart, I wished to see more shades of those who died. And I saw Tidius, son of glorious earth, lying on the ground. His body covered nine acres and more. Two vultures sat there, one on either side, ripping his liver, their beaks jabbing deep inside his guts. His hands could not fend them off his body. He assaulted Leto, Zeus's lovely wife, as she was passing through Panopeus with his fine dancing ground toward Pitho. Then I saw Tantalus in agony, standing in a pool of water so deep it almost reached his chin. He looked as if he had a thirst but couldn't take a drink. Whenever that old man bent down so keen to drink, the water there was swallowed up and vanished. He could see black earth appear around his feet. A god dried up the place. Some high and leafy trees above his head were in full, blo full bloom. Pears and pomegranates, apple trees, all with gleaming fruit, sweet figs, and luscious olives. Each time the old man stretched out his arm to reach for them, a wind would raise them to the shadowy clouds. And then, in this painful torment, I saw Sisyphus striving with both hands to raise a massive rock. He'd brace his arms and feet and then strain to push it uphill to the top. But just as he was going to get that stone across the crest, its overpowering weight would make its change direction. The coral rock would roll back down again onto the plain. Then he'd strain once more to push it up the slope. His limbs dripped sweat, and dust rose, dust rose from his head. And then I noticed mighty Hercules, or at least his image, for he himself was with the mortal gods, enjoying their feasts. He be with the lovely ankles of his wife, daughter of great Zeus and Hera, goddess of the golden sandals. Around him there the dead were making noises, like birds fluttering to and fro, quite terrified. And like dark night he was glaring round him, his unsheathed bow in hand, with an arrow on the string, as if prepared to shoot. The strap across his chest was frightening, a golden belt inlaid with images, amazing things, bears, wild boars, and lions with glittering eyes, battles, fights, and murders, men being killed. I hope whoever made it, the one whose skill conceived that belt's design, never made or ever makes another. His eyes saw me and knew just who I was. With a mournful tone, he spoke to me. His words had wings. Resourceful Odysseus, son of Laertes and a child of Zeus, are you now bearing an unhappy fate below the sunlight as I too did once? I was a son of Zeus, child of Kronos, and yet I had to bear countless troubles, forced to carry out labors for a man vastly inferior to me, someone who keep, kept assigning me the harshest tasks. Once he sent me here to bring away Hades' hound. There was no other challenge he could dream up more typical for me than that, but I carried the dog off and brought him back from Hades with my guides, Hermes and the gleaming eyed Athena. With these words, he returned to Hades' home. But I stayed at that place a while in case one of those heroic men who perished in days gone by might come. I might have seen still more men from former times, the ones I wished to see, Theseus and Perithius, great children of the gods. Before I could, a thousand tribes of those who died appeared with an astounding noise. Pale fear gripped me. Holy Persephone might send at me a horrific monster, the Gorgon's head. I quickly made my way back to the ship and told my crew to get themselves on board and loosen off the cables at the stern. They went aboard at once and took their seats along each rowing bench. A rising swell carried our ship down Oceanus' stream. We rode at first, but then a fair wind blew. 